we better get on stage here. Hey, 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 it's B-Rad Celebrity Hairstylist here, your host of the Hairstylist Empowerment Podcast, a platform that allows the voices of the beauty industry to empower with the spoken word. Thank you for joining us on today's show. Just voted number two spot in the top five in the top 10 best Canadian celebrity podcast and number two in the top 25 uh, must listen to Hairstylist Podcast of 2024. We're currently over 62,000 and thanks to you on over 50 plus podcast platforms, including Amazon Music, Audible, and Spotify. So I want to welcome you to today's show, um, which is titled Bipolar and the Beauty Parlor. Living with bipolar disorder is like riding a roller coaster through the peaks of euphoria and the depths of despair. The highs, characterized by manic episodes, are exhilarating yet often uncontrollable, leading to impulsive decisions, and boundless energy. Conversely, the lows marked by depression episodes um, envelop one in a fog of hopelessness and lethargy, making even the simplest tasks seem insurmountable. In a constant balancing act, navigating the unpredictable shifts in mood and energy while trying to maintain stability, yet amidst the turmoil, there is a profound resilience born from understanding and managing the disorder. Finding moments of clarity and strength in the midst of chaos, living with bipolar disorder means learning to embrace the complexity of one's emotions and experiences, finding light in the darkness, and forging towards self-discovery. So we're just going to pop a quick video on before we introduce today's guest. Living with bipolar disorder isn't easy. Some days, the world feels like a canvas of vibrant colors filled with boundless energy and creativity. But other days, it's like navigating through a storm, dark clouds looming overhead, emotions crashing like waves against the shore. Yet, amidst the chaos, there's resilience, there's strength in seeking help, in finding balance, and in cherishing the moments of calm. Living with bipolar disorder is a journey, one filled with ups and downs, but through understanding, compassion, and self-care, it's a journey that can be embraced. Together, we can break the stigma and support each other in our mental health journeys. So exactly, you're not alone, and that's why this show is here. So as we dive in deep in today's show, um, I'm going to offer a trigger warning, just in case um, today's topic may be sensitive to some viewers. Although we are dealing with the utmost care, um, viewer discretion is advised. So now on to our guest. So with over 13 years of dedicated service as a licensed master cosmetologist and heartfelt passion for nurturing natural curls. This multi-certified expert embodies a wealth of expertise and genuine care for her clients. Her journey is as diverse as it is inspiring, marked by a commendable tenure in the U.S. Army that instills discipline and resilience. Stacy proudly balances her various roles from being a mother of four, wow, a mother of four, and a dedicated wife, a loving daughter. Her soul radiates joy and a testament to the overall outlook of life and her interactions with the world around her. So let's welcome uh, Stacy Prescott to the show today by uh, typing hi in the comments. We are live and this is fully um, fully interactive. So if you're here, we'd love to hear from you. So um, we'll bring Stacy up. So welcome Stacy to the Hairstylist Empowerment Podcast. It's so great to finally have you on. <laughs> I know. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm super excited to be here. I have several friends that I've met in a high performance group that live in Canada. So I'm super excited to be able to experience more of, of the beauty of the people and, and everything and, and relate in a way that everyone can relate just in a human way. Oh, I know. And, and that's what we kind of bring this is to bring people together, bring communities together, have everybody be interactive, make sure if you're watching live, put live in the comments. If you're watching the replay, put replay and where you're from. If you have any questions, if you want to shout out and say hi to Stacy, you can do that as well. Just put it in the comments and we'll bring you up and we'll celebrate you. So as we kind of start off, um, uh, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? So you're a mother of four and you served in the army. 
I did. I actually have done quite a few things. Um, but yes, my children are all grown except for my youngest who's 16 and, and he thinks he's grown. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, but for amazing human beings, um, I have been in the army. I have been in law enforcement. I have taught in the higher ed classroom. I have, um, gone to the state offices and been in grant management and I have done hair and and hair just it always draws me in it's where I find my joy there was a time where I was working my full-time job um, in grant management and then I would come and work my full-time job in my little salon suite that I had at the time and I was miserable in that job in grant management and a lot of people would think hey you're at the state offices you're in grant management that's success but um as my high performance mindset coach brad bizjack says success without fulfillment is is failure it's not success um and, but i would find i was coming into the salon and i was joyful and i was excited at who i was gonna meet and talk to and how i was gonna you know make them feel when they left which helped how i felt when i left it was it's just always been where my heart is and i think that's what it is it's having a passion having an excitement for life having that you can you know we're the one of the few people that people number one allow us to touch them but also to really change their lives by how we make them look how we make them feel how we present ourselves i think really is a true indication of our spirit kind of overflowing into them so to speak because what you envision in your head may be something that they never saw in themselves like and they're like oh and especially too because you're known as the curl expert so then that way you know people may not know how to take care of it and with a few tips and tricks and things like that of being in the salon working with hair and do you also coach and mentor as well I do. I um, coach and mentor my clients. I do virtual coaching and, and I have clients actually starting to spread across the world, across the United States. Um, but I also coach and mentor stylists. Um, I coach on natural curl skill sets. I also coach on building a salon suite business around the natural curl. I coach in things, everything that goes into that, like media and marketing and things like that um, so that you can really thrive and build your business in this niche and then I also coach in high performance mindset and how that relates to the beauty industry because it was the turning point in success in my salon for me it was vital and it's it was vital in my living in bipolar disorder and not just surviving but thriving so mm -hmm. that is definitely a part of what i i coach and teach and that's a big thing the big thing is it's thriving so talking on thriving before we go deep into uh today's topic um do you think that a stylist should because people say if you build it they will come yes i do everyone or should you do you believe that if you're strong in something you should become more of a specialist as opposed to doing it all so i'm one of those people that i want to know everything about everything <laughs> and i felt like when i was trying to learn everything all at once i was completely overwhelmed not retaining my knowledge to a level that was useful and i was only okay in everything but when i chose my niche and i dove into the education and focused myself I was able to specialize in a way and raise my service to to a level that I was able to make my salon stand on its own and I was able to leave that safe job and just fully immerse myself in the salon. My business exploded. It didn't just grow, it exploded. Mm. But I didn't limit myself to the niche. Niching down helped me grow, but I still have clients with straight hair. I still take classes, like I have one coming up with um, Mary and Philip Wilson and the Wilson Cutting Method um, mm. on the 25th. I still take classes and I still serve clients because um, they hear from 
extremely satisfied clients that I do with curls and they want to come experience the level of elevation and luxury that I provide. So I'm not limiting myself. I'm being smart about how I build my skill and market. So that's my yeah, that's a, it. that's a, that's a great foundational step where, you know, I mean, people get confused. Should I just specialize in this one area, but I don't want to say no to a client that comes in. But I think the same, the saying goes, if you're not learning, you're dying, right? And if you're not growing, you're not going to prosper. And, and I think you should still know everything about everything. And if, if something isn't you, then maybe hone your, skills or really perfect that one. But I think that's what it is when we don't really understand it. And, and when I was in school, whatever you hated is what the, the teachers booked with. You got booked with yes. all day long, not because they were mean or they were nasty. It's because once you overcome it and once you learn the skill, then it becomes easy for you. And then it's like, okay, oh, I hate whining perms. Well, okay, you're going to get perms all day. But once you master them, and they don't master you. <laughs> yes. That makes a, I, I can see a whole, you know, we, we can talk about so many, so many topics. But I want to kind of dive deep into what people are going uh, to watch today, which is about mental health. And really, there's no shame in mental health. There's no shame in asking for help. There's no, uh, you know, with sharing it with people. Because I think there's a stigma that goes around, there must be something wrong. And, and believe me, you're not alone. And no one is has something wrong with them. <laughs> That's a label and I don't believe in labels, but can you share your personal journey with bipolar disorder, including when you were diagnosed and how it impacted your life? Yes. So it, it goes way, way back. I'm old enough to say that. And I'm kind of sad about that, but <laughs> yeah, actually, I'm <laughs> actually happy that I'm here and still and talking and sharing, but um, it, the, what I can remember in school, I was always the daydreamer, the one that didn't pay attention, the one that never turned in their homework because they were bored and didn't do it. And and we're talking about the the late 80s, early 90s when I was really in school. And in that time frame, they didn't they didn't really think girls got ADHD so much. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't support like there was that we were just lazy and things like that. So I grew up that being who I was, because that's who I was told I was. I, I just, I was lazy and mm -hmm. procrastinator and all those negative titles fed into me. I was also a military brat and it wasn't until I was in my adult years that I learned to appreciate that because as a child, I felt isolated every two to three years when we moved and I left my whole friend set. And I never really developed people skills. Usually military children are super personable people, mm -hmm. people, and, or they have, they just don't have the skills that they're not developed. And I was one that I really didn't develop the people skills. And it really just, that sank into me. And I had a, such a negative self image as we're coming to the end of high school. I graduated in 1994. I wanted to go in the hair industry, but in America at that time, technical college education like that was really discouraged. You were told that's what you did. If you weren't smart enough for college, if you couldn't get into college, um, you know, you'd never make a living at it. And honestly, if I had done it at that time, I did not have the people skills. You know, I, I wouldn't mm -hmm. have survived. But um, so I knew I was self-aware enough to know that I did not have the discipline to be successful in college. I knew I was smart enough, but it didn't have the discipline because, you know, I was lazy and a procrastinator mm -hmm. and all those things. So um, I come from a long line of military. I have a very instilled sense of pride in my country and service and I wanted to be a part of that and I figured if I went into the military whether I wanted to do it or not there was going to be someone there to tell me that you were about to do this there was set timed it was scheduled and it kind of it was 
one of the best experiences of my life because it did give me the discipline and the structure and it let me see the value of needing an education to really go somewhere. Um, but it also warred with that side of me that was discombobulated and trying and I felt like I was playing a game with the wrong set of rules. Like someone mm. gave me the wrong set of rules and then put me in this game and, and I was doing exactly what I was told to do and I wasn't thriving. But also in that time, you didn't talk about mental health in general, but in the military, that was your ticket out. There was no, the minute you said, I feel depressed, you were gone, mm. you know? Um, so there was no support at that time. And around 18, 19, that's sometimes when bipolar disorder starts to present itself. You can be dis predisposed, bleh, predisposed, sorry, and never develop it, or you can be predisposed and the right set of events happens in your life and it develops or the brain chemicals just do their thing. There's so, no one has a 100% this is how it happens answer. But for me, about 18, I was so lost in life and felt so alone and I felt so isolated and no one to talk to and I didn't even know depression was the word for what I was experiencing because no one ever talked about it. I just felt broken and something was wrong and it couldn't be fixed because everything I tried didn't fix it. And I had no connection to my self-worth, so I was looking for it outside of myself. And a relationship or a, an item I would buy would give me that instant dopamine mm -hmm. kick, but then it would be gone and then my self-worth would be gone and that would be you know destructive to it and it just I was in such a bad place and um I didn't know I was bipolar at the time I didn't mm -hmm. know the word for it I ended up getting pregnant with my first child I had I, one of the reasons I joined the army is I wanted to go back to Germany so bad. My dad had been stationed there. I'd studied the language. I loved the country. It's just beautiful. And I was finally on orders to Worms. I actually was at Fort Benning at the time, finally got approved for airborne training. And then I got pregnant. And of course, that you're not jumping out of planes. And at mm -hmm. the time, you couldn't be lower enlisted and a single parent overseas. So my choices were to give my child up and go overseas or to take an honorable discharge. So I took the honorable discharge, but in my mind, that was another failure. Mm -hmm. I had failed at something again. I didn't think I completed three full years serving my country. I thought I didn't make it 20, I failed. Um, throw in those pregnancy hormones and, oh, it was from that point on up and down and up and down and just, my world was so crazy, but I didn't know any different. I didn't know that I wasn't, that mm -hmm. wasn't, you know, I just knew I was. Yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't distinguish yeah. and two, and even with pregnancy, some have the postpartum depression yeah. as well as that. But for the people watching, how do you distinguish between different phases of bipolar disorder, like such as manic, hypomanic, and de depressive episodes? Well, um, let me get a little bit further and it'll explain yep. that self. Um, okay. I ended up, I ended up um, marrying a, uh, someone who, who um, dealt with something called clinical depression and I could associate with what he was talking about, mm -hmm. at least the depressive side. So I thought like, that that must be what I have. So I, I got a doctor to treat me for that. In the bipolar mind, if you treat just one side of it, not the other, you're going to create a tailspin. Mm. And because I, I lost, I had a complete and utter breakdown and my marriage was gone. Um, I wasn't healthy, you know, in a healthy enough state. I was aware enough of that, that, that I signed over. We had joint custody, but he had custodial custody because it wasn't safe for them to be mm -hmm. with me. Um, and I just kind of bumped throughout life looking for my worth and power and something outside of myself to take that pain away. Um, the church that I was in because of the actions that I took excommunicated me, disfellowshipped me. Um, I was utterly alone except for, mm -hmm. you know, my parents were always, we love you, you know, trying to help. 
Um, but it wasn't until I had, I ended up in corrections as a correctional officer because I was, I thought it would be a good stepping stone to be on the road as a police officer. And I met an amazing man who's now my husband. Um, so I love to say I met my husband in prison and just leave it there. <laughs> he was a correctional officer, but I don't, yes. I, I usually just let people figure that out because it's funny. Yeah. Um, but he empowered me. I had made it three years of college prior and he empowered me to go back and finish. Um, I had decided that law enforcement wasn't for me. And I had one year left of my bachelor's of science in psychology and I, in my understanding, you had to have a master's to do anything with psychology. And I, I was like, no, I've got to stop working in this prison now. But I was right down the road from the technical college. And I was like, mm. oh my goodness, what if I did hair until I got my master's? So I kind of enrolled in that. But that last semester of psychology, we got to the chapter on bipolar disorder. And you know, every psychology student thinks they have whatever they're studying, mm -hmm. but that resonated. I checked that box and that box and that box. And I'm in my early thirties at this time. And, um, I, I almost just broke down and started crying. I had been going to see a therapist. I wasn't really, I mean, I was functional. I was stable ish, but, you know, I kept having episodes and I was like, look, th this is help me. Can you test me for this? And they're like, yeah, I think. Yeah. So we started the deep, dark work therapy focused on the bipolar and finding the medication and getting all of that right. And that is a vital part of healing. But through that, I became very self-aware of when I was going into a manic episode, my, you know, I still was trying to find worth within myself. And so one thing when, when you go into mania for me, at least I spend money like it's going out of style. I don't have a good judge of, you know, is this a wise investment? I'm just like, here, take this here, take that. I want to buy you this present. I want to buy you that present mm -hmm. because I was excited to help someone feel good. It made me feel good. But the moment I got the moment I got my purchase, I was like, okay, now I have it. So now I'm not feeling good anymore, you know, and it would just, it would just start that cycle. But becoming aware enough of when those cycles were starting, you know, looking at my behavior and being open with my husband, he was the first adult really I could be open with about bipolar disorder. And, you know, he, he was like, okay, well, what do I look for? And when I, and when in my moments of calmness, what do I look for in this? And let's look for patterns. And he helped me find those patterns. So together, if I didn't notice it, he would notice it. Mm. Um, but he actually didn't believe mental health was a real thing. He thought that that was just people being lazy and his experience going through this journey with me changed his mind and made him extremely supportive. Um, but I've been in places un until we got the medication and the therapy right. I have been in places where I would lay down on the bathroom floor and I was beyond tears. There weren't even tears. I was mm -hmm. so numb, but I could still feel the pain and the emptiness. And I wanted to cease to exist. I did not want to die. I believe that you have a soul and that's the character and the knowledge and everything of who you are. Mm -hmm. And if you die, that goes on. So if I die, that part of me that felt the pain would continue. And if I took my own life, which I teetered on so many times to stop the pain, the only thing that stopped me was that would be my hell to continue to feel that way. And I was so disconnected and so disassociated and I didn't know anyone who was like me and why was I different and why would God do this to me and why was I just set aside and not wanted anymore. And there was um, a, a religious figure that I really enjoy his perspective on things and he wrote and, and gave a, a message called Like a Broken Vessel. His name is Jeffrey R. Holland. That made me feel connected to someone 
someone mm -hmm. out there. He didn't have bipolar. He dealt with depression, but he was open about what he was going through. And it made me feel connected. And up to that point, there were celebrities that were very brave to come out and say, I have bipolar, but their life is so strenuous that you would see them after coming out having a breakdown here or having a breakdown there. And I was like, is this, is this it? Is this what my life is? I, mm. I will always have the wrong rules. I will never achieve anything in this life. And, um, you know, it was just, it was my lifeline. It's where things started to switch. Even when therapy and medication had got me to a place of safeness and functioning and survival, that connection with another person mm -hmm. who was open was my lifeline. And it was for a while, all I had to hang on to. And yeah. I'm hoping by being open and all of us being safe and saying, I'm not different. I'm just different experience. Exactly. You know? and, and, that, and that's what's happening. And there is a lot of like common misconceptions as well. So what are some common misconceptions about bipolar that you've encountered and how do you address them? Um, I've had people tell me just choose not to be bipolar, just choose. And I'm like, mm. and it just goes away. <laughs> yes. it, if that was the case, then medication that worked on the chemistry in my brain wouldn't help because, you know, if it's just me saying, okay, I'm not bipolar anymore, that means that the chemistry part of it is not a real thing. But the medication helps. You know, there is mm -hmm. everybody, once you get the right medication, everybody can say, yes, there is a positive impact. So there's something going on biological. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just a buck up, pull your bootstraps up and, and go. It, it's, yeah, and, and get over it. I mean, because obviously medication is kind of one way, but can you describe to, to describe some, um, some strategies or coping mechanisms that you found helpful in managing uh, your symptoms and maintaining stability? So in maintaining stability, I um, got into meditation. I didn't, until recently, I didn't really understand the power of meditation. I just kind of pieced together things that would help me. So I would just go into a quiet place and just breathe and be alone and validate that I was worth something, you know, and that there was, even when I couldn't see it before, there was always a light that showed up at some point and I mm -hmm. could find that. Um, I developed uh, a couple of years ago, I found a, a, a church family that really empowers you and welcomes you and, and gives you a safe space to, to build your connection to God. So my connection with him was strengthening and my understanding of his purpose and using the bad times in a good way and that there was a reason for why I was experiencing what it was. And, and I didn't know it at the time. Um, people dear to me have, have had dealt with mental health issues that I've been able to help. And that in itself would have been enough to go through mm -hmm. that again and again. But other people have spoken to me because I share, they feel connected, they feel yes. less alone. So they have more hope. And, um, you know, so that helps me knowing there's a purpose behind it helps me and finding that purpose behind it kind of makes it like, you know, it, it's, it's not been my identity anymore. It's been my superpower, really. I, I can share with you my experience and we can be connected in this together and I can give you hope. Mm -hmm. And that, that empowers me. Um, also having my partner be hyper aware of what, you know, kind of spending trends and, and, is help kind of having him to go to and say that I, I need to purchase this and I'm not sure it's wise. Can you talk me through it? And yes or no. So having that support system is vital. Um, and those are pretty much, you know, or taking a break when I, when my brain says it's break time, it is break time. You yeah. Know? And that's, and that's the biggest thing is knowing what level, where do I feel on a balanced scale of one to 10? Where am I today? Am I feeling one? Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, or I feeling like 10, but relationships are definitely a big thing. So how does bipolar disorder affect your relationships with friends, family, 
uh, colleagues, and what advice do you have for others navigating similar challenges? Unfortunately, in our world, being open with everybody is not safe yet. Um, mm. But for me, I felt like in my mind, if I let you know that this is this is the situation we're in, and here are some tips, you know, so that you understand why I'm doing what I'm doing and how, just say in a job, here's some tips as a supervisor, just know that my memory works like this, so I'll need, you know, an agenda before we have a meeting, or I need you to, instead of saying, you know, I told you this in an email, I told you this in an email on March, and, to, you mm -hmm. know, be very detailed. It was yes. minor, but I felt like it would overcome a lot of the struggles that I have, you know. Um, and when that was respected, I th I was I was doing great. But when it wasn't, then you know, and I've experienced people that. I guess the term is quiet firing, where they make you so miserable that you mm -hmm. leave on your own accord. Yes. After I have confided in them, they made my life so miserable that mm -hmm. I, I mean, I was in the doctors. They thought I had cancer. I was so stressed that the impact on my body was, was huge. I didn't. It was just stress, you know. And so you have to be, you have to know who your support system is. Mm -hmm. You you just you um but I've confided in people and at first they were like okay bipolar they they thought bipolar from what the movies show them mm -hmm. that's what most people understand um but as they got to know me and see me and how I function they've been more accepting and understanding so being that light to say hey I have it and look I'm normal mm -hmm. has been very helpful. Um, and then people that I've just been as open as I can be my inner circle of people, you, you can be very, very vulnerable with them. So you have to be selective on your inner circle versus your outer circle versus the world. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I like the thing that you said previously about identifying because you identify it, but you don't identify it as you. Because it's not you. It's something separate from you. Because anytime you claim anything like that, it becomes you. Like say, I get, oh, I have a headache. Well, then, you know what I mean? Then you're saying, I'm owning this, <laughs> which is not true. You're being affected by it, but yes. you're not, it's not you sort of thing. But having definitely relationships, a support network is a is a big thing. And also too, that's going to shift, you know, and having turning points. So have there been any significant turning points or milestones in your journey with bipolar disorder that have shaped your perspective or approach to managing the condition? Yes. So after well over a decade of therapy and dark work and medication and just feeling like, okay, I'm, I'm stable and this is the rest of my life. Um, I got to a point in August of, so this is a little bit of my hair journey too. Mm -hmm. I've been licensed uh, as a master cosmetologist since 2011, but by August of um, 2022, I was at a point where my full-time safe job was supporting my joy in the salon because mm -hmm. I didn't have the education or tools to be thriving and successful in the salon. Um, when I was in my second semester of cosmetology school, I had an instructor pull me and other girls I didn't know about till much later aside and tell us mm. that we would never make it in this industry. Mm. We didn't have what it took. And that was playing in the back of my head and a large part of why I went into higher education fully and in salon on the side. Um, but in August of 2022, I was at a crossroads. I was going to either have to fully go into the job that made me miserable, but kept me safe or I was gonna have to be in the salon and give it a fair go and give myself a fair go. Um, so I had enough money. And at this point, in my mind, if I spent money, I looked at the money I was losing going out of my pocket. I didn't mm -hmm. look at, was I investing it wisely and would it then come back to me and with friends even, yes. you know, if I increased my skill set. At that point, I decided to take a very popular skill course. I, I was it, it was either that or business. Mm -hmm. And I was like, if I took business and I got people in the chair, I didn't have the skill to keep them. But if I took skill and I could keep them, then took the business, 
that was that was my thinking but in the skill course he um the guy who created it he had a section where he taught some mindset some business and it helped so i reached out and i said you know can you coach me can you mentor me and he was like well i i don't do that right now but here's my mindset coach and he sent me to who i mentioned earlier brad Vizjak, and mm -hmm. He offers a five day free training before you get into his paid content. Oh. And I was listening to his podcast and I was, you know, I was relating to what he was saying, but he is extremely high energy and that's him naturally. But for me, I'm, I'm not always that high energy. So I'm like, is this guy real? I was, I was like, mm. but I, he did what he did for the other guy. And I was like, I want that. So I'm gonna yes. trust the process. I went into, um, it's a five day program called Success Accelerator. And I went into that day one and he flipped a switch in my head, day one that made my entire life different. He said something, he did something, I don't even 100% recall, but he made the reality of my self worth being born into me because I am a child of God and nothing I can do mm -hmm. can take that away, negate my self worth, whether I'm successful or not successful, whether I try something and it doesn't work or it does. And none of that reflects the fact that I am a worthy individual in this world, you know, that knowledge that I didn't have to look outside of myself, that it was always here. Mm -hmm. It was like he found a key to a cage that was just hidden from me. And that five days was life changing. And if you guys visit my Facebook page or Instagram page, um, any of that, you'll see, I posted a picture of me the first day of that success, accelerate, accelerate, <laughs> sorry, accelerate challenge. And six months later, after mm. being in his program, it's not, you can't even tell that's the same person. He did that much change in five days. And if he could do that in five days, I knew I had to have the coaching. And now I know you have to have a coach. Even if you are a coach, you need a coach. Mm -hmm. And you need a group of people that are striving for similar goals. And you need that support. You need to be in the room where it happens so that you can make it happen. And you know, but that that knowledge that the only thing limiting me was me, mm -hmm. my belief that I could do it. And, you know, I like the I like the um, thought that acting in fear and acting in faith comes from the same place. You are mm -hmm. acting in on on something unseen. Acting in fear is acting in the belief of all the things that could go wrong. Acting in faith is the belief in all the things that can go wrong right fear mm -hmm. keeps us in safety and scarcity and we don't put ourselves out there and try we don't come out of our box so we can't grow um but faith you jump off that cliff and you watch your wings just explode and you fly and you learn and you understand that whatever happens it's not my worth you know i'm still worthy and i am just empowered to go forth and try and that combined with all of the previous therapy and finding the right medications together took me from survival to thriving and joy and i've never felt real happiness before i didn't before that i broke down and cried when i woke up one morning and i realized i woke up happy i didn't have to mm -hmm. talk myself into it my natural state is gratitude and happiness and that's something i thought wasn't for me that it was going to be denied mm -hmm. my whole life that i was gonna have to fake it um so that mindset switch was vital because not only did I get better, my relationships, every single one of them got better. I have a more profound relationship with my God, but my business, within six months of that first day, I had um, grown my salon suite so much that I was moving into the largest one available. <laughs> within two more months, I left that safe job forever. And by the end of that year, I had grown my income by 125% in the salon alone because I elevated this part of me. 
Mm -hmm. That was the key. That was the vital key. Well, and that's exactly it. And you said so much in there. I mean, when your tests become your testimony, knowing your identity, and every coach does need a coach because you always need somebody. Um, and to say, as far as the recommendation, it's great to recommend a coach, but you yourself, when you know your identity, you're the one partially that does the transformation. It's not necessarily from the coach. They're there to guide you with the tools and give you the foundations, but it's you when you're ready Sometimes when you're not ready and you have to do it afraid, do it anyway, yes. you know, sort of thing. But just you allow that transformation to happen where you say, I'm not going to be afraid to be successful. I'm not going to be afraid that my life can be happy. I'm not going to be afraid that I can have real relationships with real people that get me. You know, yes. there, there's so much more out there. And obviously, too, when a lot of people are kind of handling the disclosure of bipolar, um, you know, in the professional and social settings, what advice would you give to others facing similar decisions about disclosure and around them? And especially, too, with your salon as well, you have to make that choice. Do I disclose with my clients or do I just not say anything? So with my clients, I am I'm very open about being bipolar because I want people to see that there are normal people out there that don't have to have a ton of celebrity money to get the right help. It's mm -hmm. there, it's available. And like you say, if you, you can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you don't act, if you don't turn it into action, mm -hmm. it's not going to come to fruition. But sh just giving them an example that it's possible. In my salon, um, I don't hide it. I don't insert it into every conversation. I do let people know that I'm ADHD because I mm -hmm. see squirrels everywhere. I'm like, squirrel, mm -hmm. squirrel, squirrel, you know. Yep. And I just kind of make them aware that if I kind of start rambling or going down a rabbit hole, just say, hey, you know, squirrel mm -hmm. moment something. Um, when yeah. I taught intro psychology, it was the same way. I'm like, if I, because there's so many funny stories and interesting things, I'm like, just pull me back. Same as Prescott. But, mm -hmm. you know, um, what I don't insert it, but if we're in, I, I own a private luxury salon suite. I can't open the door and I'm in the best I can say is like a strip mall for salon suites. There's mm -hmm. 19 businesses in here. I can open yes. the door and we can interact like a regular salon. We can visit each other. But if I have a client that needs privacy for whatever reason, um, mm -hmm. they're, they're neuro spicy or they have an issue where they have mats in their hair and mm -hmm. if they need a, a secure, sensitive place, I can close the door. But I kind of read my client. If they share something difficult, I will share that, you know, I, I can't understand. I'm not in their shoes, but I can empathize and give them support, you know? So I'm kind of, I read the situation of whether it's appropriate or not. And yes, mm -hmm. I've made mistakes and, and I've had people that were like, okay. And then I've had mm -hmm. people that were breaking down. I, I thought I was alone. Thank you. You know, mm -hmm. so just being brave to be authentic. Yeah. And, and I think that's the thing. You'll know your people by, if you express it, you'll know your people. If they're not for you, they'll find somebody who is. If they are for you, then you have the right kind of clients. But there also must be, like you said, the ones that aren't for you. Can you discuss briefly just like any experience with stigma or discrimination related to bipolar? And how do you advocate for yourself and others in similar situations? Um. The one that sticks out to me the most was a recent position I was in. The The supervisor that, that I was working with um, had a set way that things were being done. Mm -hmm. And we weren't seeing a lot of results. But also, her set way kind of didn't go along with my mm -hmm. set way of doing yes. things. And mm -hmm. I was really dealing with a lot of, of issues from my bipolar disorder, you know, th the things I was thinking, the things I was doing, the stress I was under was really, it was affecting those things like my memory and if I'm really stressed, I start to stutter and I can't find my words and mm -hmm. that embarrasses me and I shut down and there there's a part where I can get overstimulated and, and that's just it for me. Um, so it, it was really aggravating all of those things. And she would ask me a question. And because I was so into the symptoms, I couldn't mm -hmm. give her an answer right away. 
and you know and so i would i sent her an email and i said look i've had this diagnosis here are five simple things that you as my supervisor could do to really help me prepare for our meetings and be on point and be effective mm-hmm. she chose to do none of those things that sat she did the opposite which just yes. exacerbated the situation it was it was bad mm-hmm. um and i I went through all the things. First, I tried to realize she's a child of God. She's not being malicious, just to fighting for what she believes is right. Mm-hmm. And then I I had to, you know, I was like, I need this job. I, I want to elevate. Maybe I'm not elevated enough. Maybe I can mm-hmm. learn more. And then I moved into the acceptance that I could sit there and realize that she is targeting me for my bipolar disorder and her mm-hmm. beliefs about it and how effective I can be. And I can either sit there and accept that and take it, or I can Mm -hmm. speak up. And whatever the consequences of that are, I had to be prepared to accept that. Mm -hmm. And it resulted in me walking away from that job. Mm -hmm. Um, I was called, in standing up for myself, I was called disrespectful. And, you know, it just, all the things that you're like, okay, this, God puts you in a situation where um, he'll throw a feather at you where he makes you uncomfortable, but Mm -hmm. try to raise awareness, but you kind of shoo that feather off. So he's like, okay, I'll throw a brick at you. And, you know, you're like, oh, okay, that was a brick. I see it, but mm, maybe I'm just thinking wrong. Maybe it fell off Mm -hmm. the chimney. Nobody threw that at me. And he's like, okay, if you're not listening, he's going to send a Mack truck at you and you're going to have to pay attention and make a choice. Mm -hmm. So being self-aware enough to know that you are worth respect and worth every ounce of, of, you know, accommod- I'm, I don't want to say accommodation just because you do something different doesn't mean you're different, you no. know? So if asking someone to quote the exact email so you can go look it up versus saying I emailed you, that's not a big ask. You know, Mm -hmm. you are worth that little bit of extra to make sure you're successful. You are worth a lot of bit of extra to make you successful. Just know that if you're not getting that support, you haven't found your people and act in faith. Don't Mm -hmm. act in fear. You have to act in faith enough to know you've done the foundational work and just let God show up. The the preacher in, yesterday said something that really stuck with me. He mm-hmm. It wasn't really what he was giving the sermon about, but he mentioned how Simon Peter at the Last Supper was ready to go to the death with mm-hmm. Christ. Even in the garden, he cut a guy's ear off to go to the death with Christ. He was never gonna deny him, but hours later, I don't know him, I'm not with him. And he was acting out of fear because he didn't, he wasn't acting in faith. And I was, and we're so quick to say, I would never do that. I would never deny Christ. But every time we choose to act in fear and stay safe instead of act in faith and let God, you're denying his power to show up in your life. So every time you choose fear, you're, you're doing this, what Simon Peter did. I'm not with him. Mm -hmm. You have to act in faith so that he can show up in you. I love the line from the song. I'm just, it's just a messy canvas of God's mercy Mm -hmm. in my madness. And that sticks with me because bipolar is messy and it's raw Mm -hmm. and it's real. And it's like you said, a roller coaster, but it's also a canvas for him to show up. Exactly. And <laughs> exactly. And, and, and you had it right when you kind of said that, that you said so many things and I didn't want to stop you. So I haven't been interjecting or anything Sorry. like that, but yeah. So your test is your testimony. Your mess is your message, right? Yes. And that a lot of people don't get. And, and the thing with Peter though, is with him, you know, it's fine as long as there's no threat. Yeah. I'll stand by you because there's no perceived threat. Soon as a perceived threat came, uh, I don't want anything to happen to me, you know, sort of thing. But it's a standing up for yourself. But two, you being in a creative, um, you know, business, being in hair is really creative and being with Curl is really creative. So how has your creativity or artistic expression been influenced by bipolar and how do you harness the aspect of yourself in a positive way? Yes. So. Almost every individual I've spoken to that is bipolar is has a very artistic component, an artistic 
flair. And mm-hmm. that already anybody that's artistic usually gets set outside the box. They're they're different. They're, you know, not you think, oh well, what a cute, fun artist, you know. But really that's your superpower with, with curls, you have to know the foundational tools. You have to know mm-hmm. if I hold my hand this way with this much tension, this is the shape I'm gonna get. But you also have to then step back in with your eye and look at the aesthetic of the shape you're creating and all of that. You have to develop that artistic side of you. You've got to have both sides. Just like bipolar disorder are two sides of you know the coin, you're, you need to do that. You need to develop the precision and the artistry in that and knowing that I can be both and still be whole and, and full. And it just gives me a way to present in a, in a space that's authentic to me. And because I can be authentic, I attract people that accept my authenticity. And it just, I, I feel empowered to just be me. And so I'm not under stress and dealing with all mm-hmm. of the negative fighting the bipolar disorder. It's just incorporated with who I am. Exactly. So what message would you like to convey to listeners who may be struggling with bipolar um, or supporting someone who is? Yes, there. If you're in this place and you need someone to reach out to, there's so many vital supports. I'm happy to be a support, but I've been in a place where it was so dark. It was I was so lost. Forget seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. There was no end of the tunnel. It was, I mean, I couldn't even trudge toward anyway. I didn't, I didn't know which way the end was. They're just, I was lost. And so, oh, that my Southern came out. Sorry. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was just lost. And mm. once I made that one connection with Elder Holland, um, he, um, having that connection made me realize if he could do it, there there had to be a light. Somewhere, there had to be a light. And so it gave me the will to hang on. But then if you're supporting people in that situation, you can be the lighthouse. You can be the, the, the lantern. You can be the candle. You can be the dim light that grows into a big light. And you can help them just by you know, saying it's there, have hope, hold on, I love you, you know, validating that what they're feeling is a real experience, but it's not their only experience, that they're, that it will come if you just hold on. Sometimes we just need to know that there's something to hold on for. Of course. And, and, and you, you do so much. Like I, it's incredible the amount of stuff you do that we haven't even discussed on this show, but we probably will have you back again. But um, are there any um, upcoming projects or collaborations you're excited about um, that you can share with our listeners? Yes. Yeah, so my most immediate upcoming thing is I am teaching my first hair show, super excited, in Pennsylvania at the, at the expo. Hmm. Um the, the salon training.com. If you want to go find out more, there's so many amazing people that are going to be there. I get to meet all these people I've met virtually. I get to meet in person. I'm super excited. So that I, um, have a class, uh, uh, um, excuse me, sorry. I have virtual classes coming up where we discuss the foundations of curl. I have virtual classes coming up where we get into the technical side of curl. Um, I do one-on-one coaching for mindset. I um, and high performance. Those high performance skills are how I do everything. <laughs> you know, I have things coming up. Um, where I'm doing for organic marketing. I'm doing a free webinar for organic marketing. All that's in the works and coming up. And if you watch my Instagram page very closely, um, it's listed down here at beautifully beautifully used salon LLC. You'll see those getting announced. Um, there's just so many things in the work because I have such a passion to empower other people to create their version of, of success and happiness mm-hmm. and fulfillment and their, make their place in this world because we all have one. Exactly. And, and I don't know if I can spill the tea on this, but you're also you're doing some training, too, on some new technology um, that 
Uh, I don't know if we can mention it or you want yes, to mention yes. it. Okay. I so if you want to mention it, um, yeah, it's something that even though I've been doing hair for decades, this is one of the first times I've heard of this. <laughs> yes, I'm so excited. Um, so, you know, when we're in hair school, we are learning a ton of stuff and some of it we may not know at the time is vital. So we hear the word one time and then that is the last time we hear it. So then we forget it even exists. So I don't know if this will show up well on camera, but if you look at mm -hmm. a pen and you have this outside part, think this is a strand of hair. You have this outside mm -hmm. part, which is your cuticle, sev several layers of keratin, and that's all affected by the shape of your hair and all of that, or it affects the shape of your hair. But anyway, think of think about this as the cuticle. Inside, where you have the, the pen, the, the um, ink and everything, think of that as the cortex. And then there is where all your bonds are. And then what glues it all together is the key phrase we're talking about um, today. So there is a lipid layer, to be very simple, there's, there's a, a bunch of lipids in there that glue it all together. When we do something to the hair that causes damage, we open the cuticle, we go in there and we, we kind of liquefy the CMC a little bit, and then we affect the bonds. So we have K18 and Olaplex and things like that that work on the bonds. And then we have a, a plethora of options to work on the cuticle. But up until now, there's been nothing to help that CMC. We even are actually trained in school to do more damage to it and remove it from the hair. So if you think about lightening hair and you've, you've put the lightener on, it's processed, it's gone, opened the cuticle, gone in, liquefied that CMC, done the bond things, then you go in and shampoo all of that out, that surfactant, that shampoo breaks down those lipids more and you're washing an entire layer of strength and health down the drain and you don't even know it. Um, mm. So there is a beautiful soul in this world. Her name is Cami Parsons. She was behind the chair for many years, but she's now in the tail end of her PhD program as a cosmetic chemist. She was talking to people about what we do in the hair industry and other chemists are like, why would you do that? That makes mm -hmm. no sense. And she's like, you know what? You're right. She invented a lipid quencher that fixes the CMC. So this also has a deoxidizing agent in it. So when you do something chemical, you rinse all of that chemical out of the hair. Now we all, I know we're taught in school that water stops things like lightener, but it doesn't. And we know that mm -hmm. it keeps processing. But if you use a deoxidizing agent, like I love the Malibu C deox, you know, it has saved my life many yeah. times. But this also, <laughs> you know, you, you rinse everything out of the hair and apply the Uveni and what that does, I'm sorry, the name of the product is Uveni. Um, what that does is it deoxidizes that chemical and repairs and replaces that lipid layer that, and it just builds the strength right back in. Um, and my, now Cami was not a curl specialist, you know, she, she worked on straight hair a lot. So my, and, and other people like me, um, that are curl specialists are like, well, what does it do for curly hair? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of what curly girls deal with, part of curl is an open cuticle. You already have an open cuticle and things are already messing with your CMC and they have dry hair and we have to address that. And to some degree it's very porous and all of that. And I was like, well, if we use an, a Uveni treatment, would it speed up rehydrating the hair and holding on to everything we're trying to put in to moisturize it? The short answer, and you can go see many examples on my Instagram page and other people's Instagram page, many examples of yes, it does. 10 minutes of this mm -hmm. changes changes it, the it, it, it absorbs and, and the great thing too, it's a product that you can use where you can perm and color at the same time. Yes. And without without damaging without damaging the hair. We've talked about so so much today, but is there anything I haven't asked you that you would like to share with our audience? Um, I do have a code for you, Venny, if you want it, but they have a sale right now for twenty percent, um, which is better than my code. And um get the training. Get the train it's short training. Get the training uh, at <laughs> uveniacademy.com. And my last message, my last message is even if you are in the darkness and you can't see him, God is with you. And I am reaching out whether I know you or not, my empathy is with you. And 
somebody somewhere values you until you can value yourself, but you are of worth just because you breathe. You are of worth. Yeah, that, that's, that's amazing. So would there be anybody that you want to give a shout out to? So many people. I don't know if we have time. Okay, yeah. we'll, we'll list them on the semi. Yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll list them underneath. Uh, so, so come back to the video, look above or below to see if yeah. your name is listed. <laughs> I, I would like to say definitely Brad Bizjack, my mindset high performance coach. Mm -hmm. Elaine Travis, she started out as a hair color coach for me, but she's become a mentor. She's really just helped me as I, I go into education. Such an amazing person. Um, and then, every, I mean, just everybody in the industry, I keep running into the most amazing people. And mm -hmm. the, that just makes me alive because I used to think we were so catty and we had it, we were attacking each other, but it's really the group you choose to associate with. Your people find you. So if you put out good energy, you find people like Brad. I exactly. Mean, your I vibe, your, your that. vibe is your tribe. You know what I mean? It, it's amazing. So if people want to connect with you. Where can they connect with you online? Yeah, so I have at Beautifully Used Salon LLC for Instagram. On Facebook, I have Beautifully Used Salon. Um, I don't, I'm not on there as much. It's just a way to connect with people. My main page is is a uh, um, public page, Stacy Solem Prescott. Um, mm -hmm. And I just share my journey, everything in my journey, hairdressing, religious, just experiences. And, you know, I try to share that even the things I struggle with, I don't try to say, oh my gosh, pity me, this is what I'm going through. But I try mm -hmm. to say, look, even I struggle, but this is how I dealt with it, you know, to kind of show that everybody, it doesn't matter who they are, everybody struggles. You are not alone. Exactly, exactly. So um, we're just going to jump into, uh, so if anybody wants to, um, so, so write your questions in the comment section, say hi um, in the comments where you're from. Let us know if you're watching live or you're watching the replay because I do during the live, which we're live now, is bring you up and then kind of, uh, you know, celebrate you. And I just want to talk a little bit about uh, today. Uh, we have our the sponsor, which is today's episode, has been brought to you by Beauty Industry Cruises, powerful education in beautiful destinations. The cruises from Miami, Vancouver, New York, uh, Port Canaveral in Florida, uh, Galveston, Texas, Amsterdam in Belgium, and then we also have Athens um, and Jacksonville as well. So we're going to just skip to a little bit of video here, as you can see, but. Cruises are one of the best things, which obviously on every cruise, there is a mental health aspect. Whenever you're in a different destination, it always changes your mindset. Um, so let's jump to, the, oh, here we have. So we have a comment. So we have Mary E. Goodwin. So, and then she said, this is absolutely amazing. Thank you both so much. See, we love people that interact, people that are here. We are live, so you can see that we are live. So thank you, Mary, for commenting and putting in. And we're going to jump a little bit to the uh, cruises just to kind of show what's coming up and what we have. And then we'll continue as we wrap up with our guest, uh, Stacy Prescott. So here we go. So don't these um, 
destinations look incredible. So Stacey, I'm going to ask you, it wasn't really one of my questions I was going to ask, but how do you believe, how important is education um, in our, for and in our industry? It is vital. What you learn in beauty school is foundational and it gets you to a level that you can pass your licensure exam. But as you see, just with that one product, there are things that are brand new coming out all the time that refute the old knowledge that we're being taught, but haven't made it into our textbooks yet. It is vital that you, there's only so much time to teach foundation. You have to go after the education to really understand what you you don't understand currently mastering that education and getting many different types gives you different dots to connect yeah. and when you have a unique education only you can connect those dots well of course and and a group of hairstylists all on the same <laughs> yes. same yacht same ship so so make sure to follow on facebook at hairstylist empowerment podcast you can catch up on all the episodes put your questions in say hi you can also follow me on uh instagram at brad celebrity hairstylist and then also to the cruise at beauty industry cruises on instagram so we want to thank everybody we're not quite done yet we got a little bit more but uh, i want to thank everybody for watching if you have any questions on today's episode or would like to be a guest or have a show idea which i'm thinking this might be great as a series so if you would love mental health for the hairstylist as a series um, just let me know by commenting or sending an email to hairstylist empowerment podcast at outlook.com if you would like to be a guest or pre-record your story we can have you up on the series um, for mental health and the same put your questions uh, in the comments and then if anybody has any questions um, you can apply them now if not we'll just kind of roll forward with what we're kind of talking about um, so yeah, so as we close, I just want to say that living with bipolar requires a multifaceted approach that combines medical treatment, therapy, self-care practices, and support systems. Medication prescribed by psychiatrists um, helps to stabilize mood swings and manage symptoms. Alongside medication, therapy such as cognitive behavior uh, role, uh, therapy, CBT, or interpersonal a therapy IPT can assist in coping with challenges of bipolar, developing healthier thought patterns, and improving communication skills. Establishing a consistent routine, including regular sleep patterns, exercise, and healthy eating habits can manage symptoms and promote stability. Uh, building a strong support network uh, of understanding friends, family, um, or uh, support groups can provide invaluable uh, emotional support during both manic and depressive episodes. Additionally, practicing stress reduction techniques such as mindfulness, meditation, or relaxation exercises can help manage triggers and promote uh, overall well-being. Ultimately, finding the right combination of strategies tailored to individual needs is key to effectively managing bipolar and leading to a fulfilling life outside the salon. So I want to, um, as we wrap up, and I know I've asked you a lot today, Stacy, already, but just, and you've already given this, but if there's one final nugget of gold, what would you like to leave our audience? Um, I'm gonna leave two because all those cruises, I could get on board a ship and just keep hopping ships and never come back. Those looked <laughs> amazing. Um, but I guess I just, what empowered me the most was knowing that I am not alone. While my experience is unique to me, it is not so unique that other people cannot empathize. You are not alone. You are not broken. You are not discarded. You are not unwanted. You have immeasurable worth. Yeah, that's that's so important. Knowing your identity is so important. So I want to uh, everybody remember to get up, dress up, show up wonderfully and powerfully. And I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.